Buenas tardes. How's everybody doing? Great. I want to start by thanking CUNY and Graciela for really this incredible day. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, uh, my name is Alberto Mendoza. I'm the executive director of NHJ, which is the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. I think you guys have been hearing our name a few times. Longer? Shorter? Slower. Slower. Oh, man, that's going to be hard. <laughs> Me llamo Alberto. <laughs> Uh, and it's my privilege to be here today with you guys because not only do we have many members here, but I am incredibly supportive of the work that Graciela is doing, but also bringing Latinos together, especially with a focus on journalism. Um, and so my opportunity today is to moderate this conversation that's a little bit an extension of the last one, where we're going to talk about what does really community journalism mean? And is it journalism? Is it storytelling? And so we're going to talk to two folks that are actually on the forefront and are doing some incredible work with their projects. So I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, and then we're going to jump right in. Okay? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Daniela Marrero He. Uh, I was born in Reynosa, Tamaulipas, Mexico. Um, I, my grandfather's Korean. Uh, people are like Mexican, Asian, boy, girl. They're so I'm like, <laughs> my grandfather's Korean. I was born in Mexico, <laughs> and I speak Spanish. <laughs> so that's my, oh, and I'm from the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas, so like San Antonio before I was south. So like the border, that's where I live. <laughs> I don't sound as unique. Um, my name is Charlie. I'm born here in New York City. Actually, born and raised unusually here in Hell's Kitchen, so not too far from here. Um, but yeah. Great. So, Nanny, let's start. Why, why did you start this work? Um, and tell us a little bit about the, the name behind Neta. Yeah. So, uh, I'm the director for a community media platform in the Rio Grande Valley known as Neta. We're a nonprofit. And Neta is Mexican slang for, I guess, what the American equivalent would be like legit or for real. You can use it to like enforce what you just said, like neta, like for real. Or you could also like question something, like if someone says something that you don't believe, you're like neta, like are you sure? So it's in various ways. And the name actually that we chose is very representative of the kind of platform that we wanted to build. One that was uh, culturally relevant and one that also was targeting youth and that we could also, that we could talk about serious things like what's happening on the border, but then we could also do an article about raspas or hot cheeto pizza. And so that's a kind of platform that we've built. Um, we, like many people that I know, right after the 26, uh, 20, 2016 presidential elections, there was a lot of energy about doing something, and specifically in the border with progressive community organizers. There was a lot of talk about media representation because there was a lot of conversations happening about the border, but rarely was it border residents in front of uh, cameras or speaking about our region the way that we knew it. That it's not just like this empty land where you can build whatever you want and send a thousand national troops, National Guard troops, and no one would be affected. We know that region to be thriving, to be vibrant, to be you know where we build our lives. And so we wanted to build a platform where we could share the community that we know and love. And so after the 2016 presidential elections, there was a lot of energy from people saying, I want to start a YouTube channel. I want, I want to start a podcast. I want to you know, start a blog. And so I, I come from a digital organizing background, helping immigrant rights organizations. And so I spoke to everyone that I saw had that energy to create media. And I said, what if we do this together in one platform? And we kind of become like the uh, hub of news and information for the social and cultural movements happening in the Valley. And so we started, you know, with our phones, making tripods out of like a dictionary, a phone book, and like a plate. <laughs> Very <laughs> grassroots. Know? That's where it works. Super <laughs> grassroots, right? And editing on like Movie Maker. Like it was super like, but we were like, we are like the next Jorge Ramos, right? <laughs> But, you know, that's how we started. And thankfully, you know, after months of doing that volunteer basis, we, we got the attention of foundations that were like, wow, well, you're doing good work. We want to support you. And we're like, please give us money. So now, you know, we're a nonprofit. The amazing folks at Progress Texas Institute based in Austin, Texas, they're our fiscal agent. Um, so we have a 501c3 status. And we, so we officially launched one day before the inauguration of, of Donald Trump. Is that intentional or? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> so we, 
we were like, okay, we wanna, around December of 2016, we were all meeting in coffee shops and the public libraries, and we were like, what kind of platform do we wanna build with about $2, right? And considering that n not everyone in the room when they were in the group had the technical skills, right, of editing a video or filming, or necessarily writing an article, but what we knew what we had though was we had the experience of what it means to be from the border and uh, our, from our network, our network of contributors, we have people who do very important work in the community from HIV prevention to immigration issues, uh, anti-border wall movements, LGBT issues, reproductive justice and so our model is we work directly with those community organizers and we tell them, we know you're not a filmmaker, but take the video on your phone of this rapid response protest you're gonna do, send it to us, and we'll make do with it. And we've been doing that since January of last year. Great, um, and Charlie, let's talk a little bit about your project. And I wanna really also hear from you guys if you consider yourselves journalists or are you storytellers, and what kind of role that relationship has uh, with the work that you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, my project is Quichua Hatari. Uh, Quichua Hatari is a Quechua language radio program, but a lot of times I don't define it that way so much because there's so much encompassed within this, this project um, that sometimes I think it's re reached beyond like sort of being able to define it. Um, and just to give some history, so Kichwa is about four years old now in July, uh, and it's grown pretty organically over time. It started with the, with the intention to create a unique space for the Quechua, Quechua speaking community, particularly here in New York City, um, working with folks from the community. So uh, it was actually around the time I was in grad school, I, I did grad school at NYU, the Latin American Studies program, and it, I, was, I w wanted to really, at the same time I was learning Quechua at school, I was, I was connecting to my own roots, but also really trying to uh, connect that to the realities of, of where we are today. Um, because a lot of folks, you know, when you're in grad school, you go do field work, go study Quechua communities, go learn Quechua, immerse yourself in Peru, Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, but I, I really, I wanted to challenge that and I wanted to say, no, I can learn Quechua here because there's community here who speak that language and, and currently live it. Um, and that's something that I did and when we started working together and started like exchanging um, sort of our stories, uh, we came up with this idea of doing a Quechua radio program, but we didn't even know it was, it was the first time it was being ever created in, in the country. Um, and, and it did, and actually um, we launched in July 2014, and shortly after there was a New York Times article about the, 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 about the program, and that it kind of lifted where our, intentional, our, our initial intention was for it to be really a community grassroots base, and it, it did start that way. It then, it, it then uh, had a lot of like external exposure where folks were actually coming in and wanting to collaborate, wanting to join, wanting to work with the community in different aspects. So now, years later, um, we've, we've kind of built uh, different sort of, uh, we've, we've channeled out beside radio that we still do every Friday, like tonight, uh, in, from the Bronx and from the South Bronx. We also do Quechua language, pro we have Quechua language classes for the local community, especially the younger generations like my own, who didn't have the privilege of learning that uh, growing up here or even back in, in Ecuador or Peru or Bolivia. Um, and we also uh, have done, we've also experimented with, with TV uh, from the BronxNet. Uh, we did a Kichwa Hatari TV for a short bit. It's, it was a lot of work, so we kind of put that on pause. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, there's a lot more intention that goes into like producing a television show than, than radio, I feel like. Um, and then we, uh, we've also had like audiovisual workshops for also the Quechua language youth and also the community itself. And uh, things like right now, this next week we're organizing a Quechua film festival here in, in New York City. So, and which you guys should come out to by the way, the 15, 16, 17. <laughs> um, and you know, just things like that and just like really branching out and, and realizing that, that there is uh, much, you know, the, the the community itself is very diverse. You know, just like you have people who are 
like my colleague, for example, who's like super interested and fascinated with like radio and engineering. There's also folks who are really fascinated with like the cosmologia andina. Uh, some people who are really fascinated with organizing the base, uh, like grassroots organizing. So bringing all those ideas together and transmitting that into into this project, uh, pretty much like like Danny was saying, like bring like like organizing a collective, you know, and bringing in all these experiences and and this wealth of knowledge together. In terms of like what I qualify myself, I never, I, so it's funny because we, we spoke about this before and I, I, I guess now I'm like thinking about it in my head more and more, like I, I'd never really, like I've never really classified myself as a journalist because I feel like I kind of, this was kind of an accident for me. It was more, it, it, I've taken more of the storytelling approach where it was like, well we need to transmit these stories, we need to really get these, get these stories out there from the community and you know, all we have to do is, is like Danny was saying, like we, d we, just, we just need our, our phones, you know, we just need a recorder, you know, we just need social media, the internet, and, and let's do it. Like, like, why not? You know, it's, a, it's probably messier that way, but it's, yeah. it, it, you know, you gotta do it. And, and one of the things that I find fascinating about the work that you guys are doing is that when I meet a lot of students that are studying journalism, they talk about going into this work because they want to tell the stories about their communities. They want to be, tell the stories that are not being told about where they come from, who they are as a people, or even clarify the things that are misinterpreted by their communities, about their communities. And they go into study journalism, they work really hard, they hear that word from the recruiter, community, we want to have the stories about your community. And when they get to the newsroom, there is a big disconnect between what they think is community and what the student believes is community. And I believe that most of the students going into journalism want to be able to tell these stories in their community. So um, you didn't choose the path of journalism, but you're still telling these stories. So tell me what, what is, was it based on a need or nobody was doing it or you just felt, hey, just like earlier these folks are talking about, don't wait, just do it. Uh, well, I have a confession. I'm a journalism <laughs> school dropout. <laughs> Um, I went Someone will give you a, 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 a <laughs> Maybe I should have said that sooner, right? <laughs> um, Honorary degree, anybody? <laughs> you know, you want to take her? Sure. Um, so I went to school in Boston at Suffolk University. And, um, you know, my story of going to Boston is actually kind of ties into a lot of the things that we want to tackle at NETA. When I graduated high school, besides going to a good university, the other, like, maybe also number one requirement was I wanted to get as far away from home as possible. And I was like, so I literally went on, like, a college board, I think it's that, and I typed in uh, universities that were, like, in the East Coast, and I was like, I hear Boston has good universities, and then I said, who would accept someone with, like, a B plus, and I found Suffolk. <laughs> and I was actually part of the student paper. I was the international news editor. And um, I mean, I did a few internships too, but my junior year, I, I mean, I was already a little bit discouraged going through the journalism program at Suffolk, to be honest. Um, I loved the people I worked with in the student paper, but they were all white, right? And so there was a lot of disconnect with that. And a lot of the journalism professors were also all white. And so while I respected all of them a lot and they all taught me so much, there was, a big disconnect in the stories that I wanted to share or just the way that I was learning in the classroom. And also my junior year uh, being in Boston, you know, there were just a lot of, I remember when I got to Boston, I, I was like, I'm gonna go find like my gay utopia. And of course, Boston's not that, right? I'm like, I'm gonna flee the board and go find this like crazy place with like tinders popping and stuff. <laughs> and that wasn't the case, right? And so, uh, on top of that, right, leaving the border to go to this big city thinking I was going to go live this metropolitan life. And that wasn't the case, right? There was, Boston is so expensive to live in, uh, on top of mental health issues, on top of not having a support system, and just uh, bad experiences. I said, I'm going to take a break, right, from college. And I went back home, and I never went back. I started working with community organizations on the border, specifically along immigrant rights and LGBT rights. And I used the years I had in journalism in, from Boston and, I, and what I learned in telling stories and, in, and then telling the stories from the community there. Of course, 
from a social justice perspective. And so I don't know if I would call myself a journalist because I respect the industry a lot and I respect the title of journalist a lot. And I, I know that the work that we do is from a social justice perspective and so I'm more comfortable with the word storyteller, you know, because I, we're always careful with how we portray NETA. We never say, we are like the next New York Times, right? Like, because we're, we're not. There is space in journalism and storytelling for, of course, like the New York Times, but then there's also space for community media where people are sharing perspectives and sharing how we view the world in a very unique and certain way. And so that's why I refrain from saying the word journalism or journalist and in our website, you won't see the word journalist anywhere because we wanna be very clear with everybody. Like the people that work at NETA, we see the world in a certain way uh, because of these experiences that we've been through. And so the stories that you see here reflect that. And, and Charlie, you, I mean, you're in New York and so you have opportunities to tap into a lot of resources. What was missing in the relationship with media in a way that your community was not being covered that again, you felt a need to do something? Well, I guess it's, it's I think what, what might be telling is, is the fact, I, to, I mentioned how, what, how the New York Times kind of wrote an article about Kichwa Hatari, and the same journalist, the article before, right before he had written about us, he wrote about linguistic isolation and the isolation of indigenous communities in New York City, as in like, you know, there, I mean, it exists, linguistic isolation exists, but I think a lot of people also relate it as in like, oh, these people are like really like hidden in the corners, like the dark shadows and nobody can even touch, you know, nobody can talk to. But what this did, you know, at least within the Quechua community is it, it really created a movement where people felt like, oh, like my, my story can be told. And, and, but not just, a story of language or a story of identity, but also a, a story of migration, a story of like what you're doing now, like that's also important. Like what situations folks are going through now, maybe because of their, maybe because of their background, because of their, this, this cultural uniqueness to them and like how they're not, they're being misunderstood. So, you know, what we, you know, what we've been able to do is at least create a space where folks are reflecting what they're thinking and, and what they want to communicate to their community uh, through the radio or through TV or, or, or through these other channels. Um, and I think that speaks a lot, whereas I think before, you know, there wasn't that option, I would say, you know, I mean, even me growing up, I never saw somebody like me on Univision or Telemundo, to be honest. So, you know, for folks who have been thought to be to not belong, and not only here, but only in, but also in their home countries, you know, where indigenous communities are already marginalized. They're already not they're they're already not being portrayed, or the realities aren't being reflected in in in, in countries on mainstream media. For them to feel valued here, and for them to feel like they have a space here, to 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 live and to create culture, to cr to continue. Uh, you know, speaking their language or, or at least having that option, you know, is it's super important because it's worse to not have that option, you know, and not see yourself reflected and then just feel like there's only one path you can choose. Uh, Danny, because you studied journalism, you actually also know what that, what that experience is like to go through school, right? What was missing from what you learned in school that you found out instantly the moment you were out there telling, telling stories about your community? And I think you can both jump into that. Um, you know, I, I think it's also a little bit on how I viewed the world at the time and how I saw university. You know, I saw university as I need to find something very prestigious so I can, so my mom can say, oh, tengo una hija estudiando en Boston, right? And I mean, <laughs> when I told my mom I was coming to this conference, and before I even said Latino Media Summit, I just said in New York, and that was it. That's all she needed to know, that it was a conference in New York, right? <laughs> like, it could have been a, something super small, and she was just like, mi hija está hablando Nueva York, right? And so I felt a lot of cultural pressure in that, in that that's how I saw university, that I, it was like an, a symbol for my family, right? The first person to go to college, I'm sure many of you in the room know that pressure very well. And um, so I think because I saw college like that as something that I was trying to like prove to myself and to my family, 
I set the bar really, really high. And of course, there is just no one place that can give you that, right? Um, and you know, net, actually through the work at Netta, we try to address that too, because there are so many people in the Valley that we feel that because of where we're from, we can't fulfill certain prof professional or personal goals, that we have to go somewhere else to fill those. That professional goals being, you know what, that we can't be in the Valley and start something like Netta. We can't be in the Valley and start a company because we're on the border. The next closest city is four hours away. You know, when we say South Texas, people think San Antonio, and that's like barely South Texas, that's central, right? Um, and so people feel that. People feel that, number one, they're professional goals, and even like commerce recognizes that, like the federal commerce, whatever in Dallas, they call that the, the uh, brain drain where people from the region, like the Rio Grande Valley, they'll study in the valley or they'll study somewhere else, but they'll never come back. And so it leaves that gap. But there's also something that people don't talk about, which is the cultural drain, where people leave the valley because they feel they can't meet certain personal goals, whether because they're gay, queer, or trans, or because they see the world a certain way and they don't think they'll ever find a community in the valley. And so I felt that, and I know exactly what that's like. And I know that I set the bar really high for Suffolk University, that there was gonna fill all of these gaps inside of me and that was gonna make everybody so proud. But I think you know, the problem is really rooted from where I'm from, that we need more pride from being on the border. And a lot of that is influenced by media representation and the way the media portrays the border. And so how does the rest of the world view the valley and the way they view us? and the way that they, how they think that we'll succeed in the world, and then also how that impacts us. How do we view ourselves being from this region, right? And how does that impact the way that we interact with the world? And how has local media covering the Valley, how does it differ from how you guys approach it? Um, well, so they ride with Border Patrol on the boats. We don't, <laughs> right? Uh, we are much more critical of Border Patrol and ICE activity in our communities. You know, local media, Univision and Telemundo, they do, I mean, I'm sure you all have seen the news. There is a lot of things happening at the border right now, you know? And so I really commend the journalists that we have there. And I don't want to live in a world without them there. I don't want to live in a world without mainstream media. But I do think that Neta also adds a critical voice in, okay, you know, you saw this report on Telemundo that Border Patrol agents are saying that the valley or the Texas-Mexico border is one of the most dangerous places for them, you know? And then, okay, that's what the government is saying. But then you can come to Neta and read more critically about that and read about maybe how government, Border Patrol is skewing those facts or see how maybe questioning the role of Border Patrol in our communities. And so I think that that is a role also of community media in adding more perspective from what mainstream media is covering, and then you go to your community or media outlet and get a little more perspective or analysis on it. Charlie? What's that, what's that original question? Sorry. Well, for, <laughs> first, actually, <laughs> in, in part, what, you, mean, you also went to graduate school. What are some things that you didn't necessarily learn in the school setting that when you jumped into this work, you're like, okay, ooh, I need to learn that quickly or I need to jump oh. into this? Um, well, I mean, like I said, I was always, I was, I never intended to, to, to even like do storytelling or journalism or any, of any sort. Um, it was really, uh, it was, it was pretty accidental, and I, my entry into it was through social justice work, working with immigrant organizations like in Queens, but also working alongside like independent media uh, channels like Democracy Now. Um, where you know we did what I what I did see is like the power of independent media and what it can do you know and the potential for it and it doesn't necessarily need to fit in a framework um, so you know what I what I've learned along the process and I ended I think the last last question saying this it was it's very it's very messy it's uh you know working with like if you're gonna say that you know you're you're you have, your journalism or your storytelling aligns with social justice, you know, then then it has to be informed by the base. It has to be informed by the community, and and that's not easy because you're constantly like reflecting. You're constantly 
receiving feedback from the community. You're constantly working with them. In my case, we built a collective around this where it's like they're not one person is a person that's calling all the shots. It's it's like five of us. So, you know, going through all of these these you know these sort of fences, you know, how to try to jump all these fences and to come to like one decision, but it's super important. Um, so I, I definitely never, you know, never learned, and that's been something that's been a learning process. We've I've been learning with the community, and then seeing how then the product of that is beautiful. It could be very magical. The fact that you know, um, folks, they like for example, this past year, you know, folks in, had advocated from from our collective to participate in the UN Par Permanent Forum Indigenous Issues, and I was like, sure, you know, like let's do it because like, it's a yearly thing and. And but they were like, no, we want to do our, our our intervention in Quechua, and I was like, okay, well, how are we, how are we going to do that? And they figured it out. They're like, well, we have this person's going to do the interpretation, this other person from Spanish from Quechua to Spanish, and that person's going to do from Spanish to English, and we're going to have a whole team, like we're going to have a big representation. And I was like, okay, cool. I couldn't make it because I was at work, but I was like, you guys got this. <laughs> and then it came out the next day, like a huge article with, from in Ecuador, El Comercio, saying like. First time there was an intervention in Quechua at the UN Permanent Forum. I was like, that's so fascinating because this is this Permanent Forum has existed for years, and it's the first time an indigenous language is actually being spoken in the setting. And it took like migrantes, it took like migrants, you know, immigrants organizing from here to like, like it to 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 include themselves in those settings and 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 to create space. So. I mean, it, th those are the kind of products that can that, that can occur from working with with the community. Now, social media obviously plays a significant role in how you connect with people. But w you know, I actually come from the border myself, San Diego Tijuana border, um, and I know that my family was connected to Spanish language media, but I wasn't in the same way. Um, my mom still watches Univision religiously. I don't in the same way. So. You have uh, obviously a lot of pride in the work that you do in your communities, but how do you connect with a different generation that perhaps is used to really connecting more w with news from the traditional setting? Okay. Sure. Um, so, yes, my family also watches Univision and Telemundo religiously. Uh, when I was doing community organizing, my grandma would joke, she's like, Te veo más en la tele que en mi casa, you know, because I'd be doing the interviews for community organizing. Um, <laughs> You know, Neta, I think without social media and without people having cell phones, I don't think that we would be where we're at now. You know, I think that social media has in some ways kind of leveled the playing field for voices that otherwise wouldn't have the resources to be amplified, to be amplified. Um, there are a lot of issues and, you know, we notice we are really only reaching people 18 to 32 which is the, the demographics, we want, the ages we want to be reaching, but sometimes when we're doing coverage of, uh, you know, like knowing your rights, like if an ICE agent or Border Patrol agent comes to your house, we don't, we really want to target an older population, but not only that, um, in the Rio Grande Valley, there are a lot of areas that don't have good internet access, whether on your phone or Wi-Fi at your home, and so, you know, people are watch, people follow us on Facebook, but they're like, you know, I really want to see your video, but it doesn't load on my phone, right? Or I really want to see your photo, but it doesn't load on my phone. And these are, you know, individuals who don't have Wi-Fi. And it also happens that these individuals who live in unincorporated areas, you know, outside of the cities, they are also the individuals that need some of this information the most. Um, and so there are a lot of challenges in not only just being on the internet, right, and reaching people that don't really, really consume the news on Facebook, but also the people that do, right, that also don't have cable at the houses, how are we reaching them without also adding a whole print element, which would be a whole monster of its own. Charlie? Yeah, I think social media for us, and well, the internet in general has been our best friend because, well, our radio is an online radio, is online, so that's how people mainly listen to it. Um, but it's been interesting because in the past couple of years, or more, more so in the past year, we've started doing a lot more like live stream of the radio program because we realize that, you know, people really like seeing who's behind who's behind the microphone. People really like, I don't know, seeing people talk and like being able to comment on it. And you know, and for us, it's cool to see like 
people commenting like you know uh, uh, and like live like live commenting on like what we're talking about and also being um so also trying to call, also like realizing that they can call in and they can participate themselves and and so that's helped I guess with the rate and a radio aspect but then social media has also helped I guess in general getting the message across and and creating this and cr like I said again be creating the space that wasn't hadn't been there before and I think people I think sometimes we also underestimate people like like the the older generation, I guess. Like I feel like a lot of times, what do you mean old? a lot of them are on. <laughs> I'm, on I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> I looked at you because then you could take it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, because a lot of them are on on Facebook, and like it. You know, a lot of them like like peeking to see what's happening. A lot, like my parents. My parents are on social media just to see what people are saying and doing. And I'm like, and. They don't post anything at all, you know, like no pictures. They don't even have a profile picture, but they're like, oh, I saw you in a radio program today. That was an interesting topic. I'm like, you don't, like, how would you see it? Like, I don't even know you're, you get on Facebook. They're like, no, we get on it <laughs> to see what's happening with your tias and stuff. Um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's become, it's, it's super powerful. But, but also, I think what we, and I'm realizing that, that, um, that it takes also work Again, working with the community to also keep building this and and keep bringing in new perspectives. Uh, this past, you know, actually a few months ago, we're still doing these these workshops. We're doing like audio visual workshops where people are learning, you know, how to film, how to do video, how to take pictures, so that the, so that the folks from the community themselves have the power to go out to their communities and document their own stories because. Even we can't document everybody's stories and represent all the Quechua, Quechua community, the whole diversity within the community. So, you know, we give, let's give more people the power to do so. So, traditional media now, is it friend or foe? And how do you change that relationship? You go first. Uh, I don't think we're foes. Uh, we do like media accountability pieces, right? If there's a certain frame that is a little weird toward immigrants or if there's a frame of, or if there's a story about like Border Patrol or ICE that we think um, is a little bit misleading, we do, you know, we do uh, stories on Netta saying like, you know, this story that you saw on Channel 4, Channel 5, here's our take on, on the topic. Um, I don't think we're foes, you know. There is like I said earlier, you know, there is room for everybody in journalism and in reporting, and I think we all have different roles. You know, Univision and Telemundo in our community, they have their role, and they're everywhere, right? And they have their role in reporting that, and then there's community media like Neta where we are a little more critical of what they're reporting on. The same, I think we're foes. I think it's, if, if anything, it's our job to hold, you know, those that media, you know, whether it's Univision, Telemundo, or whoever, you know, accountable and and compliment and compliment on uh, their, you know, what they're what they're portraying, the stories that they're portraying, and also make it relevant, even more relevant for our community, so that they can easily understand it and they can see the significance, you know, like um, so, like one example is like the. Um, you know, ICE raids and, and all the country and what's happening at the border. And, and so people in New York, they're like, oh, this is sanctuary city. Like, we're, not, like, we're just going to sit back. And, and, and that's what the impression a lot of folks from the community have. And, not, and like, we're like, no, like, you can't sit back. And like, you know, this is, and then we get all, you know, political about it. But um, it's important to bring that in and, and really, like, as much like it, it probably hurts, you know, a lot of folks from the community. But like, you gotta tell them the truth and like the blunt truth. Like, we're all in danger. Like, this is gonna happen regardless of where you're at and where you live. You know, ICE has to meet their numbers. They're not gonna meet their numbers like in uh, like in just one area. Like, you know, New York City has a large concentration of of undocumented immigrants. Like, they're gonna eventually come knocking on your door. But we have to be ready. Um, so I think I, I guess like complimenting like. That news bit, you know, that we hear like an, on EBC on that's probably like one minute, two minutes, complementing it with like a, an hour discussion, <laughs> like a 30 minute discussion on the real implications of this news story. Like, I think that's, that's where I would see our, our role being. And has there ever been any collaborations with mainstream media? 
Uh, oh, yeah, I was going to add on that. Um, not officially, like, neta en Univision, but... Uh, <laughs> Why not? Sounds good, right? <laughs> if, if there, I don't know if there's Univision people If they really want to talk about what's happening in the valley, right? they, they really should, um, right? Yeah, but, but there, it's not officially. Actually, in the beginning, there was a little bit of rejection or we heard from, like, local journalists. Not, not re rejection, but uh, skepticism. Right, I guess that's a better word, toward Neta and the role it would play in our community. But now what we're seeing is, you know, that people are like, oh, Neta survived, right? You're actually a year in and you're still doing the work. Um, what we're seeing is there are actually journalists who work for, you know, the local NBC or Sinclair, right? Um, and whenever they get leads, right? and they are not necessarily able to cover the story in an angle that they would personally want to, they actually reach out to us. And they're like, hey, I'm just gonna like give you this information and walk away, right? <laughs> or there's gonna be a, like recently, um, we had that Senator Merkley who went to try to get into one of the immigrant children detention centers in Brownsville. And you know, one of our really good friends, friend of Neta, he's a reporter for the local NBC affiliate. He was like, hey, there's gonna be the senator, he's gonna try to go into Brownsville, you know, y'all should come over right now. And so it's been really helpful too in, you know, getting past that initial skepticism phase and building, it's also like building personal relationships with the reporter, right? Adding them on Facebook and, and building those friendships that now reporters are actually sending us things that they wish they could cover. So they're still finding a way to cover th those stories, yeah. even if they can't do it directly, but almost with the intent that perhaps they went into the industry for. Yeah, yes. <laughs> not everybody, but yeah. <laughs> um, from our end, not really. Um, if anything, sometimes journalists reach out to us because they want, they need assistance in, in getting their story, especially if it's covering indigenous communities or, um, or sort of like this, this, this very distinct reality among migrants. Um, but I also like try to like push journalists who come to our spaces, especially the student ones. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, try to give something also uh, to the to the folks who who are doing the work and like not just extract, extract and just like leave forever, you know? Um, and so like we've, you know, we're, we're very conscious about that and like letting folks in, into the, the spaces like the radio. Um, and uh, I was gonna say something else I completely forgot. Um, well. If, I if it comes back, I'll... Oh, oh, sorry, super quick. Um, it's also worked vice versa, like with Neta, and there are events or stories that are happening that we cover, like especially around like abortion access and the LGBT community, that if we hadn't covered it, perhaps people wouldn't have seen the value in that story or that the story was happening. And so we've seen several times that we'll cover something that we know normally wouldn't get press, and then like a day or two later, right, the journalists will reach out to us and say, can we, you know, email this, this source? And so it's worked both ways. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, actually, we're gonna open it up for some questions, but I actually have a question for you, Graciela, to start us off with, because I do think it's interesting to cover this and have this discussion with, you know, citizen journalists, per se. What is the role in citizen journalism as it relates to CUNY? Or the interest? Uh, so we, I think the school is a big, big supporter of uh, local and community journalism. This is what we teach, is we're also preaching uh, that. Uh, and, and we have a specific uh, master's program, it's called social journalism. And basically what we teach there is that you, it's for people to create, for media makers to create their outlets, not from top down, but from the community. And so, and a lot of what uh, our students are taught in, in specifically in that program, but we also talk about this with the rest of those programs in, in the masters, and maybe Jeff can say more about that, is that you first do, so the, the students go, they do come kind of immersion in the communities or they come from communities and the outlet has to serve that community, but like the needs need to come from the community, not just us assuming those are the needs, but you also, probably, no, no? okay. And, uh, and I think, and this panel is, Oh, please, oh. yes. And we pay. We, and we pay, yes. Unless they want to pay. Well, let's let's pay. wait <laughs> until they ask. We'll take your offer. Let's <laughs> um, no, talk. And, and, since, <laughs> yeah, and since I have the mic, I, I wanted to say this panel is very close to my heart. And we um, 
did this, did the, so Charlie and Danny and Paola, who's not here, uh, they were um, they were a result of the, the map project. So the, throughout the semester, when the students were creating the map, uh, they had to also uh, find one very interesting, the, the, the outlet in their um, geographical area that they found the most interesting for whatever reason. And so we had, uh, I read about them, uh, all three of them and their outlets uh, through our students, through my students' um, projects. And that's uh, when uh, we decided to invite them. So I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. All right, we have some time for uh, some questions. Eh, yo quisiera saber cómo están conformados los equipos de, de sus medios y eh, con cuánta frecuencia ustedes publican, cómo se organizan, hacen consejos de redacción, cómo se organizan ustedes y sus equipos. Eh, nosotros tenemos uh, five full-time staff, en ETA incluyéndome a mí, y tenemos eh, una red de personas en todo el valle porque somos cuatro condados en la parte más eh, cerca de la frontera de México. Entonces tenemos una red de personas en todos esos cuatro condados que hacen uno o dos videos al mes. Entonces ellos tienen sus eh, trabajos de tiempo completo en diferentes organizaciones, ya sea de migración, la prevención del VIH, LGBT. Y eso nos funciona muy bien, en tener ese tipo de, de red, porque ellos, y como ya están en esas comunidades, en esas organizaciones, saben cuáles son las campañas y las historias que tenemos que estar elevando. Entonces, ellos, nos dicen, ellos mismos nos dicen, ¿verdad? Esto está pasando. Eh, nosotros publicamos entre uno o tres nuevos, nuevas historias al día, ya sea videos o artículos. A veces hay días que pasan dos o tres días que no publicamos nada, eh, pero en lo regular tratamos de, de perder algo nuevo al día, de lunes a viernes. Nosotros tenemos el programa de radio cada viernes este, y hacemos, lo hacemos live en vivo. Eh, y la verdad que todos somos voluntarios, todos tenemos nuestros trabajos o sea, y, y como que el, el programa de radio siempre ha servido como un el espacio semanal, ¿no? no solo para informar a la gente, o sea, estamos también reuniéndonos regularmente para hablar sobre los temas que hay que cubrir y, y, y con quién hay que hablar, eh, pero eh, los bienes o sea, sirve como un, también un tipo a veces como reflexión de la semana, ¿no? que, se, que, que, que hemos visto las noticias y, 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 y que hay que este, resaltar pero como nos estructuramos, como había dicho, como un colectivo más o menos, donde no hay como una jerarquía diga, y, y todos más o menos tiene, tienen sus, sus conexiones con sus comunidades, porque no, tampoco es, eh, o sea, porque es que hecho aquí, no quiere decir que es, o sea, todos se conocen, ¿no? Es muy grande, o sea, hay diversidad dentro de las mismas comunidades indígenas, entonces, eh, el rol de cada uno también ha sido como eh, hablar con sus propias comunidades, ¿no? Otra pregunta. Uh, Antes de eso, how did you monetize it? How did you actually turn this project into a money generating or even a nonprofit? Uh, the first attempt was a Kickstarter. We failed, uh, <laughs> and then yeah, but we played it off like good Latinos. We were like we got secret funding somewhere, and we're just gonna <laughs> fake it till we make it. We didn't like accept defeat. <laughs> And I'm glad we did because, you know, that's how we kept going and we faked it, just straight up faked it, like that we had the funding for like six months. And then I think that's how funders gained the confidence to reach out to us. <laughs> and then we, that's how we became sustainable. <laughs> Perfect. Here, so, uh, that was actually one of my questions. I, um, okay. I direct a, a non-profit uh, newspaper in Costa Rica or small also community and of course our challenge is always financial and we know that grants foundations and 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 uh, being funded by them long term is not sustainable and we're always trying to diverse the revenue so um, I would like uh, to know just a little bit more about the finance of uh, both of them and then also what do you see La Neta, and uh, I haven't, I haven't, a key, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. Um, thank, thank you. <laughs> sorry. You gotta say it though. Oh, okay, wait, hold on, because I don't see very well. Kichua <laughs> Hatari. 
There you go. Uh, what do you see yourself in five years? Uh, the, the media itself, uh, uh, just keep covering news from that region in particular or expanding, for example, through the state of Texas or expanding more in uh, New York, in, in the five cities or, or the beyond? The border, all the border. Well, where do you see yourself <laughs> in five years? Let's just say five. My least favorite question. <laughs> um, so I could start answering a little more of the the funding, the financing part of Neta. Um, so we are right now almost entirely uh, financed by foundations. So like Ford, um, Neo Philanthropy, For Freedoms Fund, things like that. We also know that right now all the funders like us and there's probably gonna be a day where we do something that they're not gonna like, right? And so we are right now actually looking into how we can develop in we know it's going to take years, but it being that we're reader funded, you know, and it's complicated too because, you know, our audience is 18 to 32 year olds and about half of that means you're most likely in college, which means you're not going to donate to Neta, right? Um, and so we're trying to figure out a way in how we can They can buy coffee, readers. they can give you a donation of $5. Right. I mean, I'd rather buy coffee, right? Um, let's be honest. All right. So we know that the people we need to target to make Neta sustainable is... Bring them coffee. Bring them coffee or people outside of the valley, right? Outside of where we... And actually right now, most of the individual donors are people in Austin, Dallas, Houston, and New York actually here. Um, and so we're really trying to figure out like what activates people, we're, we're right now trying to test if we should go fund a monthly subscription for all of Neta or fund a monthly subscription for a specific issue. Like maybe someone's really passionate about abortion access in Texas and they're like, I wanna fund you X amount a month so you can keep covering abortion access in the border. And so we're just, right now it's a lot of testing and figuring it out, but it is honestly what keeps me up at night, you know, in that we, right now, thankfully, the funders and our goals are aligned, especially with how much is happening at the border with asylum seekers and detention centers. But we know one day that inevitably there's gonna be a break. And uh, it, once, if, when that happens, maybe we can connect again. Um, what was your second question again? Five years. Five years. Oh, in five years. Um, yeah, see, see um, we would really love well, I think one of the, the biggest factors of success of Neta is that we are hyper-local, is that we are about the valley. And so we know our community really well. And, you know, most of our headlines that you'll see, it's like blah, blah, blah in the Rio Grande Valley. Rio Grande Valley resident, blah, blah, blah. You know, because we want people to see that, like LGBT community in the RGV, there are no other outlets really covering that. So... I think, though, that there has been a lot of energy in from El Paso to Laredo um, and the Valley and Corpus of getting more representation, more media in along the border as well. And I was actually looking at the map earlier, the one that y'all showed, and I noticed like in between El Paso and the Valley, there was like nothing, right? And so, I mean, but there's ports of entry all along, right? And there's very terrible things happening at those ports of entry to asylum seekers. And so we have been talking to community organizers in El Paso, and El Paso is a community that is very similar, what's happening culturally and politically, very similar to what's happening in the Valley. And so we're trying to see how we can ex either expand or replicate what we're doing in Neta, but you know, different branding for El Paso, because we think that the hyper-localness of it is a big factor of why people love it so much. Um. So, I mean, we, like, like I'd mentioned before, like, we're kind of all volunteer run, so I can get some sleep at night. Um, <laughs> I don't have to think about funding too much. Um, but, I mean, I think, so I can answer more, I guess, in the, the five-year five question. I think that's something that we've thought about a lot, and now that we're coming into four years, like, what are we going to do now? Um, are we going to try to monetize this? Are we going to try to make this sustainable in some way. And I've been around a nonprofit world for a long time working in, in nonprofits and seeing like how how that can also be very problematic sometimes. Uh, and like the pressure to like constantly go out, like find new sources of funding, like renewing funding, like 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 how are you gonna like how are you going to sort of uh, sell yourself basically. Um, and I think up till now we've kind of been very comfortable sort of uh, like 
growing organically and and sort of playing to each other's strengths. Um, but I do think we will get, we, we should, and we will get to that point where, we, you know, we'll, we'll try to monetize ourselves. However, I also, um, uh, I also don't want to just say like, oh, well, this is like something that's solely, like, we're not the only ones that are being underrepresented, uh, underrepresented here in, in New York City, you know, talking about this context. And in terms of uh, like indigenous presence or like indigenous languages, you know, there's also a lot of mixed echoes, there's also Nahuatl, you know, uh, there's, um, you know, Totonaco, there's Garifuna, there's everything, you know, and, and something that, um, you know, that I've thought about is like, what if we, instead of just like, growing uh, like by ourselves on our own, like we really reach out to these other groups and do something together and, bec and we have already, we have created like some sort of network and like building, even like building like un, una red de comunicadores, you know, we've done that, we sort of work, uh, in the past, but it's more just like putting it on paper and like, like getting sort of every like everyone on the same page and and building recognition from then. So it's not just folks from outside looking at like just Quechua radio, but also looking at like indigenous language media in in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Right here in the front. Again, guys. Hi. <laughs> um, I, I think, especially more to you, uh, I think um, I have a husband who's Guatemalan, and he, I'm Colombian, so I, I don't, you know, the Central American is very different to what growing up South American is, and even within its own, but he denies a lot of his indigenous roots, even though his family, like his grandparents used to speak Gachiquel, and which I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Gachiquel, correct me, anybody, if I'm wrong. Um, but how how do you see that connection with like the other communities because i know like when i've been to my, my stepfather is ecuadorian and i've been to ecuador quite a few times and i see that community of speak of you know they want to speak that that um indigenous tongue and they want to be part of that have you seen that in those connect because you mentioned those connections and trying to build the connections with other indigenous language like how has that been and also how are you growing um, the community? How have you seen the community of people who don't speak wanting to really learn more how to speak it? Um, that's my question for you. And I just have a question for you as well. Being a student, um, you know, you have an NAHJ and I learned about NAHJ because of one of my Latina professors. And I try to set up a chapter in my campus, but because of the way that my school is set up, you need to have like 10 people to join. And I was one of like three Latina journalism students at my school. Um, so like how do we create that community even, or how are you working to help students create a community at small colleges where there really are maybe, we can't, we need like 10 people, yeah. you know, but there aren't. So those are, those are my two questions. Are you starting? Yeah. <laughs> you think about that. No, no, no. no I got it. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. It just I'm may just, take the rest I'm of the teasing, time. I'm, so. teasing, <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm um, teasing. Uh, in terms of like, I guess like for the Quechua community, like it was it was more like you create the space and they will come. And I think the same is with the other spaces as well. Um, for example, I know this is great. Um, it's a, uh, a, f a friend and some of you who's been doing Quiche radio here in New York City for a long time and transmitting um, to Guatemala, you know. Uh, and But also realizing that he also is in a way by default, a leader in his community because a lot of the community here, the Guatemalan community, listen to him, um, and uh, you know they're 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 listening to find out like what he's talking about, like they they want to know what the, what news is going on, and um, but I think it's 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 really interesting. I mean, I've been in like some of these spaces where they're they're calling, um, like for example, we we there was a health survey done recently on indigenous communities and. And it was, it was one of the first times we all like kind of like got together in one room and like talking to each other and and I realizing that there's a lot that things that we have in common in terms of like our relationship to the community issues that our community goes through th goes through here like lack of access to resources in their languages uh, cultural insensitivity in institutions like the court schools and hospitals and not realizing um, where these where folks are actually coming from. Um, so we're like, well then, you know, if we're battling the same issues, then why, that doesn't make sense to do things like individually, separately. 
Um, and realizing again that because they've already created this space, you know, they've already have become leaders in their community, they can motivate other people. So it's in a way, it's also like organizing, you know, organizing your community. And that's really how Sakicho Hatari started. It was like the intention was to organize the Quechua community and find leaders and create some organization or something, or, or, or at least like a campaign. Um, but it became this, like it became like this like media space, it became this space where then not only like 20 people, you know, felt like they could relate to the issues, but uh, you know, thousands of people now follow and um, are paying attention. All right, as far as NHJ, um, actually NHJ is in a really great position right now. Um, to say at the end of 2011, we had less than 800 members. Um, the economy, you know, jobs were being slashed, it was just hit really hard. Um, this last year, we crossed the 2200 member mark. So in a matter of just under six years, we almost tripled the membership, and I'm pretty sure that by the end of the year, we'll hit 2,500. So there's something that's happening, I think, and for many reasons why this is really, we're going in that direction, but I'll tell you that 600 of those are students. So we tend to average about 25 to 30% of our membership that is students, but we haven't really changed the way that we do the work. And uh, I, I, I'm going on my third year, and it's, it's been one of those labors of love of taking on what you can to kind of, one, get strong again with funding, make sure that you have programs that are going to support the community. And we actually have 24 student chapters, so it's, I'm disappointed that we haven't updated our website because it only does show 12, but we have 24 student chapters. So one of the things that we're looking to also modify is making sure that it isn't just the, the 10 that are needed, but perhaps look at a, a region that may be able to collectively bring each other support and have that almost like chapter support, but also just multiple schools that kind of make up that, that, that team. Students change, graduate, and they move on. And so that's always the challenge is that you start with 10 and then, you know, they all graduate. And if you didn't really focus on bringing somebody new on, then the chapter kind of goes a little dormant. So we're having to change all of that because we don't, we want the support mechanisms to be there. And then the last thing I'll say is that we actually have dedicated one staff member to now to focus on all student initiatives. We really want to leverage NHA's connections to making sure that we're placing students. We're also going to start a grant that is in support of cost of living. Sometimes people can get a small grant and you can maybe come to New York for $2,000. That's not going to get you very far. We'll talk about that. <laughs> But then we don't want that to be the reason why a student, I wouldn't be able to afford to go. So, and there's nobody that I could have asked for money. So we wanna be able to make sure that you now have a grant for, for cost of living that you can go to New York and actually have that opportunity. We would also partner you with a, a member from the local chapter to make sure that you have some emotional support that can guide you through the city. And maybe they'll even have a spare room that you can stay in for the summer. And believe it or not, whether they're NHJ or not, there are a lot of people that care about mentoring others, especially young talent. And so for us, it's also finding a mentor within that company that is gonna take you under the wing so you can manage that politically and in the city manage the actual aspects of it. So there's gonna be a lot more coming in that. Um, and just stay connected because if it's not through a chapter, the organization can also directly provide support. One more question. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Emily Gertz. Uh, I'm an environmental reporter and I'm a fellow here in the Town Night Entrepreneurial Journalism Program. Um, for both of you, I wondered um, what uh, roles do you see for like collaboration or alliances with non-Latino media? Um, we've, we've, I mean, we've, we've collaborated before, um, actually not with non-Latino media per se, but like non-Latino sort of efforts and organizations um, because we do deal with uh, like native languages and native languages. We do a lot with, um, for example, Endangered Language Alliance here in New York City. We collaborate with them a lot. Uh, like I was mentioning the health survey, realizing that it's, it's very important to, to get a, to have us be counted. Um, and um, also, I mean, working, collaborating with uh, institutions with like universities like NYU and Columbia, like CUNY. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, actually, the, the film festival is going to be held at CUNY Grad School and then also at NYU uh, next week and, and, uh, art, and an art center in, in New Jersey. So, you know, really like expanding our horizon and like just, you know, getting ourselves to those spaces and like even if we have to force ourselves. <laughs> Honestly, we haven't considered this. I think right now we are very focused like in the Rio Grande Valley, which is an area that's almost 90% of people that are Latinos, right, or Mexicans. And, uh, you know, when I think the term diversity, the word diversity means different things in different regions. Like, I feel like if someone said diversity in New York, you would picture picture different ethnicities and races. In the Valley, diversity to us means different. For example, is do you have someone who's queer on your board? Do you have someone who's undocumented on your board? You know, And so I think uh, in terms of uh, collaborating, we're looking more internally right now when seeing like our local news channels that are all, almost always Latino reporters, right? Even if they're not necessarily a Latino outlet, uh, covering LGBT news or Latinos who are queer and transgender, are they covering them fairly? You know, are they covering things that are not outside of immigration? Like, how are they covering those issues? Um, we haven't gone beyond that, but I think right now we're focused internally and how outside of immigration and diversity and what it means for our community. Great. I just actually want to take a second to thank all of the NHA members that are here. If you guys can just raise your hands. There are many of you, but there could be more. So meet me outside. I have my square and I can take your, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. Um, but I do want to plug our national conference that's coming up uh, July 18th through the 21st. Um, one of the things that we're changing this year and part of all these changes is we're focusing on training. We are going to make sure that our members that come to our conference are going to get skill sets that are going to help you be more competitive and stay on top of the game. So you're not going to see a lot of panels on diversity. Uh, I, I, someone's ever told me they got a job because they sat on a 90-minute panel hearing about diversity. <laughs> and we want to get you guys hired. So it's really important that we're providing the skill set that you need to stay competitive. Very, a lot of digital stuff. It's really, really important. When you're in school, you get a lot of great training. Once you're done with school, good luck finding a, a program that can offer something for free. So for the registration, all of the trainings will be included, so just know that. And if you are unemployed, NHA is offering you a complimentary registration to make sure that you can access the conference and our Career Expo is one of the biggest that we've had in many, many years. So I invite you guys to join, become a member, and continue to support organizations that are doing this kind of work, local work, but also um, this Latino Summit can only get bigger. So thank you.